Dag the Eve, August Fall Cheer. Hi and hello. It's John O'Sullivan from the Irish Pagan School here. And we are coming to you with a quick chat today. Just a, another kind of follow up in regards to some of the areas of the Irish law and one very particular section and one particular ability of the Irish law that has meant a lot to me that I have found very, very personally challenging but also very personally satisfying in my exploration of it. And funny enough, I'm wearing a t-shirt that gives you a pointer or a clue about what today's topic is going to be, which is the three strains of music. So um, <clears throat> first things first, thank you very, very much for being with us here in the Irish Pagan School and for joining us on our YouTube channel and kind of just connecting with us. You know, we're getting some really, really great comments, some really, really great responses. The likes, the subscribes, you know, have been really, really fantastic for us. Um, and not all the topics have been easy. Let's be fair. You know, um, the last video I recorded was a discussion about male violence, and it was really talking about some kind of righteous and justified anger that I personally was feeling and personally processing around loss of life, um, continual loss of life of female females and female presenting people in our country. So if you want to find that, it's back on the pre on the channel. You can kind of like understand some of my perspective and the statistics behind it and how it is actually a problem. But as I mentioned in that talk, that one thing that has really helped me overcome my own personal challenges and my own personal upbringing with elements of toxic patriarchy, toxic masculinity, like uh, male aggression and this kind of boys don't cry and like, you know, the put up and shut up mentality, which led to <laughs> ongoing states of depression in my life and, and challenges and like difficulties. We're not going to get into it, but it, it's very, very common. It's very easy to see where all of this comes from. And so this particular facet of the Irish lore um, really, really touched me. And it's connected with the God I work for, because I work for Antagda Moore, the big Dagda, um, one of the, the, the leading kind of gods, one of the few kind of in the, the Laragabala era and one of the mythology was actually referred to by the other to it, Adanan, as a god, um, their good god of druidry. And not because he's morally good, it's because he's good at it. Everything. Whatever he chooses to do, he's good at it. And so this is where we see this expression of musical talent. And he is one of the two people in the lore that actually performed this feat. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So what we need to kind of quick talk about is what is it? And where do we find it? So what we're talking about here is the Irish mythology, which is the oldest kind of information we have about the origins of, of Ireland, the origin stories almost, which is known as the Lerigabala era, the Book of the Taking of Ireland or Book of Invasions. And it speaks about the immigration and emigration of multiple different tribes coming into Ireland, becoming part of the Ireland, Ireland Ireland's culture, ruling Ireland, conquering Ireland, whatever it actually is. Um, and during this process, we find the two of the Danon, the arrival of those who will become the Aeshi um, or the Irish gods as they arrive in. And of course, the one thing I absolutely love is there's a, a prophecy which speaks about the arrival of the two of the Danon. Um, it is the king of the Firbolag, who's king in Ireland at the time, Uchid, and he has this mad kind of dream he goes to his druid a guy called Kassar and Kassar does his augers and does his druid craft and comes back and goes yeah pretty much we're facing an invasion and the language he says is that there is a fleet of a thousand ships coming carrying like a thousand heroes who will be victorious in every strain skilled in every art who will be victorious in every strain and so like the two of the Danon are coming in and it, it's a thousand heroes like you know it's a huge fleet of people and there's they're all pretty much heroes um, so we've talked about it, I've touched on it in some other areas, that the Irish gods are not kind of monotasked. It's not like there's this one god of love, one god of death, one god of this, one god of the sun. You know, we don't actually have that structure. That's kind of Greco-Roman kind of influences on other pantheons kind of coming in. Um, but, you know, the Irish gods are very much multitasked. And actually, to, uh, to take a quick sideline and answer a question that we had, um, before they arrived into Ireland, it actually does tell you where they come from. They come from these four great cities, um, Phalias, Gorias, Murias, and uh, Fundius. 
And so they are peoples of these four great cities, which are said to be cities out to the north and east of Ireland. Um, they leave fleeing oppression there. They travel around the, the, the coastline. They travel around Europe, actually. And it says that they learn all forms uh, of kind of occult or hidden knowledge. And they become experts in every form of science and um, alchemy and magic and everything else. So... They didn't just leave and come straight to Ireland. They leave, they traveled around and this tribe of descendants kind of emigrating back home or immigrating back home to their home of their ancestors kind of enhanced their knowledge on the way. So where did these strains come from? What are we talking about when we talk about these this music? And it's, as I said, the Book of the Taking of Ireland. And the first time we have it mentioned is with Lou. And so I covered a bit of a video on Lou, if you wanted to kind of go and find that in the thread. It's you know a bit of my personal perspectives on Lou, but also touches on how fascinating he is as a character, this kind of child of destiny slash prophecy slash doom. Um, but also this deity, this multi-talented, this Ildanok you know, of many skilled, many interlinked skilled uh, character. And he presents himself to Nuada, who's king in Ireland at the time, and he has to kind of overcome the doorkeepers and the doorkeepers are like sorry mate not today when i have any and he's like but i'm really good at this but i'm really good at that and he lists all these things that he's capable of and they're like yeah but we have someone who's good at that already so like you're of no use you're literally of no use to our tribe because we have someone who can do that already and so it gets to the point where he it does eventually kind of find his place which is do you have one person who's good at everything or capable of everything and they're like well actually you know we don't we don't have anyone inside who's good at everything. Yep. Again, I'm a Dagda guy. <laughs> I have my own perspectives of it. And I have to wonder if on Dagda had been present, the good God, he is who is also good at everything. Would Lou have actually gotten in? I don't know. Um, I wrote a story about that, which was, again, my personal perspective and exploring of the lore and the relationship to those gods, which I absolutely love. But what happens is Lou finds his place inside. He faces a challenge of strength against Oma, the champion and strongest of the two of the Damon. And then he kind of faces a challenge of skill and strategy where the vehicle boards are brought out. And it's this kind of lost game that we know existed from our lore, but we don't actually know how it was played or what rules it is. But it's this kind of, in fact, one of the hero feats, one of the great hero feats um, that you kind of had to have to be recognized as a hero and a champion was vehicle, this, this board game, this strategy game. And so the boards are pulled out and Lou is put to the test and everyone is stepping up and everyone's kind of facing him and betting and gambling around that. and he cleans up he absolutely dominates everyone at this game of strategy um and so Nuada is watching this Nuada is king and he's kind of like you know he's aware that there's going to be a Fomorian invasion he knows things are going to be difficult and so he's he's looking for what is the right angle here and so he's watching Lou carefully as he kind of shows his ability with various skills. He then comes in, shows that he's physically capable of challenging Oma. He shows that he's intellectu intellectually capable in strategy. Um, but he's still, at that point, it's still not fully there. And then Nuda calls for a harp. And this is the first mention where we have it because the harp is brought out and it's given to Lou. And he is set to the challenge to perform the thing by which a harper is known. And what that thing is, is the three strains. So anyone could play a harp. Anyone could learn to play a harp. Anyone could be good at playing a harp. But you're not a harper unless you can perform the three strains. And what those three strains are, are here on my T-shirt, <laughs> which is the, the Galtre, the sor Sorrowful Strain, the Gyantre, the Joyful Strain, and then the Suntre, which is the Sleeping Strain. So he performs this act and this is the first time we find it in the lore where he plays the music and the music of the sorrowful strain moves all of them everyone champions heroes kings all of them to weeping to mourning to grieving this expression of emotion and just wailing and i'm not just talking a single manly tear rolling in your cheek it's full-on you know expression of this emotion and grieving and wailing getting it out of you and then he moves the music forward and he plays the Giantre, which is the joyful and it's revel. Everyone is on the tables and dancing and it's, it's just kind of powerful movement, this up energy to just enjoy the expression of music. And then the Suntre and he plays it. He actually says he plays the Suntre every night for a week 
so that anyone who hears this soft, subtle, low music is lured, lulled into a very restful sleep. And so it's this music, this, this kind of strains. This is my first reading of it, my first kind of hearing of it. I'm like, that's pretty fucking cool. It's these musical expressions. And now we all have different relationships with music. There are many different types of music. But anyone who has been exposed to music in their time, in their life, has felt music move them. Some piece of music, something somehow, some collection of words, some like collection of notes, some lyrics, some expression of music has moved you, even if it's just foot tapping or, you know, full on head banging mosh pit style or, you know, actually just feeling the, the sound hit your diaphragm. Like music is such a powerful, creative and expressive kind of thing. And so we have this expression of Lou doing the, the art and doing the music. And I thought that's pretty cool. But then the story kind of carries on as I'm kind of following and exploring. And one of the magical items that's linked with my God on Bag the Moor is a harp. And it's this harp which carries two names. It's called Dordob Law, which is the Oak of Two Meadows, or Ker Kahar Kor, which is the four angled music. And so we find this harp later on in the story. And it's when the Fomorians have invaded, the battle is going on, the two of them are actually in ascendancy and winning. But while that's going on, there are still ravaging, raiding war hosts going around. And so, you know, the Dagda's own home gets raided. So after the main kind of conflict, when Lou fulfills his destiny and, you know, it leads to Balor's demise, the Dagda finds out that his own home is raided. His own stuff has been taken. And so he gathers up the champion of the two of the Danon, Oma, the strongest, his brother, and he gets Lou. And he doesn't rally an entire war host. He doesn't gather like a raiding party himself. It's just the three of them, the three lads, Dagda, Oma, and Lou. And they go and they pursue the people who have raided them. And it's this very specific story because not only has the land been invaded, not only has the people been harmed, not only have the battle, we see the demise of Lou, and uh, oh, sorry, of Nuda actually dies during the, the second battle of Moitura. So, like, you know, the, the, there is loss of life. There is harm done to the two of the Danids to the tribe. And then there's the personal affront of Dagda having his own property stolen and this expression of music, this instrument, this magical instrument, or, you know, the, well, yes, the instrument. So we get to the point in the story where you would think he'd be very angry or very hurt by this, what's happening. And so they arrive in and... All of the warriors are there, and actually in this hall is Bress, the previous king, the fallen king, the wrongful ruler. And it's him and his own posse who have raided the Dagda's home and stolen his treasures, stolen his property. And so all of the warriors of the Fomorians kind of gather, and the Dagda just reaches out his hand and he calls the name of his harp. He calls it from the wall where it's hanging. And the, the magic of him and his instrument, it leaps off the wall to his hand and it strikes down nine men just by moving towards him. It just moves to him and nine men die in a flash. And at this point, you're like, oh, well, it's going to go off. Like, you know, it's going to be vengeance. It's going to be like harm. It's going to be hurt. But it's not. What happens next is that the Dagda plays the harp. Now, no one else had said that no one else could play this harp because the music was bound inside the harp unless it was called forth by the dagger. And so he plays the harp. And he doesn't just play the harp. It, this is the second time we see in the story where there's this expression of the three strains of music. And so Dagda is shown in this moment not to just be a guy who can play a harp or a guy who owns a harp. He is a harper. He can do the thing by which a harper is known, which is to play the three strains of music. And so amidst this war host of his enemies who have violated his land, caused harm amongst his people and violated his own home and stolen his own items, he plays the music and he plays the gold tray and the Fomorians all around him are moved to woe. 
and they wail and they cry and it's it's this outpouring of emotional release and then he moves the music on and he plays the gantry and they joyful and they revel and they're moved to like expressions like you know where they just have to dance they just have to feel that expression of joyful life in music and then he plays the sundre and he woos them all down into a nice lulling relaxing sleep and with his music he moves them through the states of those emotions and then brings them to sleep and then he leaves this good god of the two of the dan and capable of calling mountains to throw their rocks upon his army calling fire from the sky hiding all the rivers plays his music works them through the emotion of it and leaves him oma and lou And so that part in the story, you know, following through with my own understanding, my own kind of teasing this out, like, you know, the treasures of the die, the one of these magical items which are linked to him is, of course, this harp. And it's part of my God mark, part of my tattoo I have on my wrist for this reason. But the reason that I have personally come to attribute to this expression is that for me, not just the physical nature of the harp, but these three strains performed by both the Dagda and by Lou are the key to emotional intelligence. They're these keys to understanding that emotion is just a state of being and that rest and sleep is our reward for processing our emotions. And it's taken me a lot to get to that. You know, again, I was raised you know, North Dublin in the 80s, rough and tumble in parts, you know, boys don't cry and like, you know, you just never show weakness. I was raised with all of that. And so, you know, I repressed a lot of my emotion in my early age, in my early years, and it came out in unhealthy ways. It came out in, in anger kind of bursts or in intolerance for myself and isolationism. So, or, you know, it, it's it's a difficult kind of thing to process. And so this idea that this very big, very powerful God. This one who, you know, during the first battle of Moitura, charges the battle line and opens up a gap for 150 of his own warriors to follow him through, personally, you know, can also take his thick fingers, his, his, his workers' hands, because he digs the trenches of Tara to make Wrath Bresh. He can also move them nimbly on the strings of a harp. He can play music to such an degree of excellence that emotion is moved by it and so for me it was such a really great experience to understand that you can be emotional you can be emotionally vulnerable you can be emotionally joyful because that's the other side of it too because like that guys don't cry but it's also don't dance no oh well, no you don't want to be seen dancing what are you doing dancing for no you need to stand still you know so this, it's this numbing or dulling down, which, again, comes from, if you want to go far back in the history of it, it probably comes from pre-World War I, Napoleonic Wars, where young men were weaponized by training, by society, in order to become better cannon fodder for the battles that were going on on a global scale, where men were not rewarded for anything other, any other emotional expression other than violence and aggression. So that's where we are. That's kind of, we're, we're in a stage where, generations of men have been dehumanized and in some places are still dehumanized back on track i was trying to talk about emotional intelligence um the last video i did was very emotionally charged as i said during the video i'm hurt i'm angry about the loss of life of female and female presenting people in my country the ongoing loss of life 224 women and female presenting people from 1996 to 2020 loss of life predominantly those who have caused this loss of life, males. So I went into a lot of detail in the last video, but again, for me to move forward from those moments, and that's where I finished that video, how do we go forward from it? You know, we can't just point fingers and say, oh yeah, it's all this. You know, we need to talk about how do we get better? And enabling boys to be emotional and that to be okay grow into men who can be emotional and it can be okay. 
you know, enabling men to be able to have emotional dialogue with other men. And that's okay. And this has been a big part of it for me, this, this musical expression, because it's okay to cry. It's okay to laugh. If I laugh loudly, I don't ever want to be shushed. Because for a period of my time, I was. I was told I laughed too loud. No, you laugh too loud. You're too loud, John. Why are you too loud? That is something that is very harmful and very hurtful. The moment you turn around to anyone and say you're too blank, it's damage. And so this minimizing of self, this kind of pushing down and kind of repressing of, you know, our emotion, healthy, natural state. We're like intellectual creatures, emotional creatures, physical creatures, spiritual creatures. We're this multifaceted faceted entity of existence. And if any one part of that is repressed, if any one part of that is crumpled down, then the entire person, the entire being is not who they really should be. They're not living to their potential. They're not growing fully because parts of them are still held back in unhealthy ways. So that's why this expression of music, and not just music, I'm talking emotional release music, really, really sings to my heart. It really, really makes me feel. And that's a good thing, because the only way to process your feelings is to feel them. I say to people, and I have said for many years now, you got to feel your feelings. And I gave them stag the rules. I started joking at the first point, but as I've explored more of my relationship with the dad and how he has helped me and how this relationship has grown and how the more understanding of the law, I'm like, why is it not a dad the rule? If dad can help people process their emotions, even his enemies who have done harm to him personally, not just to his tribe, but to his property, to his home, who have violated hospitality by taking advantage, if he can still move them through emotional release to a place of rest, to a place of restoration. And why can't I? Why can't, you know, I experience the same journey through that relationship and grow to be a better, safer person? There's one other thing I like to talk about with this. Um, and it comes from the Irish language, which I, okay, kids, Stay in school. <laughs> you know, I'm going to go full dad here for a second. Stay in school, do your learning. And, you know, yes, when people say you'll regret it later on if you don't, I'm that person. Yes, absolutely. I was, I was said to me, John, you'll regret it if you don't. And now here I am, you know, growing up and I'm like, I fucking wish I had pushed myself to learn my native language more. But again, that's where I was. I was a young kid kind of trying to navigate existence and teenage and hormones and whatever else. But now in my life, I'm able to look at things with a bit more clarity, a bit more analytic, analytic understanding. And it has actually brought forward a better appreciation because when we talk about emotion and states of being in the Irish language, the kind of verbs that we use is, is orum. So if I'm talking about myself, so if I wanted to say, I'm hungry. It's ta ochrus orum. So that's a poor translation, though, because that's an English Berla language that like translating into Irish. But if we actually go word for word, what they actually mean from Irish, ta ochrus orum, ta is the, ochrus is hunger, orum is actually on me. In the same way you would say, ta lena orum, I have a shirt on me, or ta gyanzi orum, I have a jumper on me. You also say, I have hunger on me, or the hunger is upon me. It does go into other states of being, though, and this is where the emotional element comes in, because in order to say sad, or I am sad, we don't define ourselves as sad. Because when you say, I am sad, you're saying, I am, like, I am defining myself as sadness in English, in a way. If you kind of take it into Irish, you say ta brown orum. It's the same verb. It's on me. Sadness, brown, 
anger, farag, happiness, ahas, all of them are orum, on me. And that, more than anything, has been a great opener of my mind because I am not defined by my emotions. I am not anger. I am not sad. I am not, like, joy. Those things exist, and for periods of time, they are upon me. But that also means that there are periods of time where they're not on me. In the same way you can take off a Gansey, take off your jumper, you know, there are times when the sadness isn't on you. So this concept of language, this linguistic structure has really, really helped me kind of redefine my relationship with emotion. Because I can say comfortably that as of yesterday, or V Faragorum, which was V is the past tense, I was angry or anger was upon me. And so, though I still have Faragurim, I still have anger on me, there's less of it. And I know that I will not always be angry. It will move off me. I don't have to define myself by that. But I need to use the anger while I have it in the right way. You know? Or the sadness, the sadness and the grief and the upset that I have because of the harm being done in my country, because of the harm being done to people in my land, people who are just female or female presenting, I'm sad for it. I need to acknowledge that. I need to use whatever energy I can take from the sadness for the right purposes. But I don't define myself as sad. I don't live in sadness. It will be on me. And then much like a cloud leaving off a sun, you know, it will move. It will move on. And there will always be another day. There will always be another moment in which to feel and to express feelings in a healthy way. So... A lot of this now does go back to my learning, my personal kind of diving in and reading of the Irish mythology and my pursuit of the Dagda. As I mentioned in the video, how I met the Dagda, all I got was a name because, again, I was very much chosen, uh, intentionally oblivious at the time, so much so that the Dagda had to mor bother the Morrigan to bother a Morrigan priest to say his name out loud in front of me. So I would just have a name. But then I began my pursuit. I began my chase of the knowledge. And along the way, I found so much more to help me in my own self that I am eternally grateful. Actually, I should be careful about that. Uh, you know, using words like eternal to an immortal deity. You want to be careful about what you're committing yourself there to. But I am, for this life, extremely grateful to the Dagda for what he has helped me to understand and what his teaching has helped me kind of find. Because again, he's a very masculine deity. He's a very male presence, but he's not an aggressive male presence. He's a God of hearth and home. He's the guy who kind of has like other magic items, sure. But one of them is the cauldron, the cauldron that no one goes away unsatisfied from. It's like, come to my home and have food, have a meal, be comfortable, be welcomed. You know, he's the guy who goes out and dig, digs the trenches to make sure that there's safety, the security. He's the person who has his kids come to him going, oh, I'm in over my, over my head. What do I do? And he full on dad modes and is like, I'll take care of it. So if he can take thick workers' hands and perform delicate music to move emotion and to move emotion through people, and that is healthy, normal, accepted state, and in fact, culturally required. Remember, Lou had to perform that feat to prove he was valid in front of the Tuatadana, the gods, Nuada as king in Tara. He had to perform that same feat. Then there's an awareness that wailing and sadness is part of na natural expression of emotion. You know, ahas, revel, joy, it's part of your natural state. Don't hold back on your laughter. Don't hold back on your tears. They are normal. That is healthy. It's an, an expression. It's allowing for the emotion to be on you, but then acknowledging that it's not defining you. And over time, it will pass from you. So I've talked about it for quite a while now. And as I mentioned, processing a lot of my own emotions 
But I thought maybe, especially after the last time we sat together, it was a bit heavy. It was a bit difficult. And thank you very, very much for anyone who kind of joined me for that video and made it all the way through, right? You know, it's tough stuff. But there's no point in me talking about emotional intelligence without showing you or then coming back to it and saying, this is how I do it. This is the thing that has actually made me find my way through it. And, you know, I've actually gone as far as to find particular songs. I have songs in my playlist that I know I will jump around. Yes, that's a pain. Um, there are songs that will just make me smile. Dario G, Sunshine. Um, and there are songs that will move me to, to feeling my sadness and to passing my sadness and to allowing for those moments to on me too. So maybe there's something you've picked up here. Maybe there's something that you find interesting about it. Maybe you too will go and find some songs that, you know, resonate with these three strains, Gyaltre, Gyantre, and Sundre, and allow you the emotional release that you need to find your rest at the end of it. What I'll say is thank you very much, Gaurav Mila Mahagas, um, for being with me here. I am so delighted to be doing this with our Irish Pagan School community and so, so delighted and touched and humbled by the responses, by the comments that we're getting and by the questions that you're putting down there as well. We are capturing up those questions and coming back and kind of connect them with them as they can. So if you don't want to miss the response, make sure you hit the like, subscribe and the bell for notifications. So until next time, look after yourself. Remember, as I always say to a lot of my Live at Five community, but also now to you, our YouTube family, you're a unique expression of humanity. There will never be anyone in this world who could be more you than you. So be the best you you can be. And look after yourself. Salam.